Hey guys, it's Robert Weinberg. I'm here today with Sam Parker. Sam is the CEO of My Credit Guy Credit Restoration and uh, big industry, a lot of players. Sam's definitely at the top of his game and he's my preferred uh, credit repair partner. Um, Sam's been in the industry quite a while. So I want to talk uh, today a little bit about credit and being a first time buyer and the different things that you can do and the different questions you may have from a true expert here with Sam and um, you know how you can really optimize everything to make sure that you're getting the best loan for your needs. Sam, appreciate your time. Appreciate you uh, taking a little bit today to uh, join us. My pleasure, Rob. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So um, we're gonna really talk and, and head out this call with some major questions that I've had written in by some viewers here about credit for first time home buyers. So the first question here is, you know, a lot of people get worried about applying for a mortgage when they have low credit. They think, well, if I've got already a credit score that's fair or poor, or it's not excellent, and then I go and I actually apply for a mortgage, my credit's gonna tank, I'm gonna have problems. So can yep. you talk a little bit about how a mortgage inquiry will impact a credit score, especially if you're in that, you know, mid good or fair range, and if is it really as bad as everyone makes it out to be? Yeah, that's a that's a really common kind of anxiety point that people are, are honestly freaking out a little bit too much about, Rob. Um, one inquiry isn't going to do much to your, like if you went from no inquiries, you've been good, you haven't had your credit pulled anywhere, and you went and you had you pull your credit, a mortgage inquiry, you're talking anywhere from probably zero to three points maximum on, on the effect that it's going to have on your credit. If in a 30-day window, after your pull, they went out and they should not do this, but if they went out and they had their credit pulled another eight times in that 30 day window, it should not impact their credit at all in what is considered a like industry. So like if you're trying to get a car loan, then you have a bunch of inquiries in the next 30 days and a mortgage loan have a bunch of inquiries in the next 30 days. Each one of those inquiries, it should only be the first one in the next 30 days that hurts you. Okay. Now the credit bureaus are wishy-washy on the window. Um, some of them imply that it's 30 days. Some imply that it's 45 days. And so we always just want to work in worst case scenarios. And so we just tell our clients to assume you got 30 days, but in general, inquiries are just not that big of a deal. It's, it's, it's just when a client comes to us and they're like, Oh my gosh, my credit scores are so low it's because of all my inquiries. It's almost never the inquiries that are actually the, the big, culprit it's almost always you know collections charge-offs late pays or max out credit cards so guys you heard it from the source here uh these inquiries don't get too wrapped up in it and sam was also just talking about the shopping window so i mean we discussed this a lot you do have that window if you're talking to multiple lenders if you talk to a lender and you're not happy with the advice you're getting or their reputation or whatever it may be there's a lot of different things that you can do like going to another lender and talking to more. There's, there's a lot of competition in the industry, so don't feel bad about having your credit run by a more reputable or a better rated lender if they're gonna give you better advice. Like Sam said, that's not gonna make a big difference or really any difference in most cases in your credit score. And that first inquiry is really minimal. So um, hopefully that, that gives you guys some confidence in getting your credit report run by a mortgage lender because as we always talk about, you wanna get pre-approved as early as possible in the process. Even if you're six or 12 months out, you still want to get pre-approved by a mortgage lender. You still want to talk to them so you know what you're dealing with from a strategy standpoint with your credit. So moving along, um, for people that, you know, they're in a position where maybe they're like a 618 credit score or a 574. They're like right on that cusp of being able to qualify for the home loan that they want. What are the main things, the main steps that you think people can take? If they don't have time to go through an entire credit repair process, they're really close. What are the couple things that people can do in like a 30 or 60 day window to boost their credit score before applying for that home loan? I mean, the number one thing that they need to pay attention to is their credit cards. That's, that makes up 30% of the credit score and people act like it's no big deal. They'll get to their credit cards when they get to them. But let's really worry about these inquiries or let's worry about this late pay. Um, you know, from three years ago. And it's, it's not that it's, it's, and, and that's a good, 
it's a good defense mechanism, but I'm just going to be honest with anybody watching this. Like it's your credit cards. It's the way that you're spending money that you don't have right now. That's dropping your credit score because the credit scoring algorithm is a risk based algorithm. Smart people put this thing together. And one of the big components of it, or one of the big red flags of it is when they see your balance to limit ratios on your credit cards creeping up and up and up, it's a, it's a, very accurate indicator that you are cash poor and that you're having to rely on these credit cards, which makes you a higher risk. So if that's not the case, like if you looked at my credit on a monthly basis, you would think this guy might be in trouble, but I max out one of my credit cards every month because I get excellent uh, reward uh, points for it and I fly American all the time. So I want to get as many points and miles as I possibly can. Right. And so in that case, the, the, the scoring algorithm would be wrong, but at different points in my life, it would have been right on. And knowing that I did not have money in the bank and that I was floating a lot of like when I started my business, it, it was all on credit cards. I wouldn't have been a great credit risk right then. So anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling on this one, but it's a big one in credit cards. You get those things paid down below 50%. And then below 30%, so there's different thresholds where the credit scoring algorithm hits you harder. Once you get above 50%, so if you have a thousand dollar credit card and you're above 500 bucks, a red flag is going up. You are losing points. You get it below 50%, you're going to get some of those points back. Below 30%, even more points. If you can keep it between 5 and 10%, you're going to be maximizing your credit. So first and foremost, if you're trying to get qualified for a home loan or get your points up quick, look at those credit cards because those can be paid down quickly and they report back quickly. Beyond that, Rob, then you're getting into going in and removing things, and that's where it takes a little bit longer. But on the flip side of paying a credit card down, you could also call and say, hey, I have great pay history with you guys. I want a credit line increase, and you can impact your balance to limit ratios that way. You can also go to optoutprescreen.com, O-P-T-O-U-T-P-R-E-C-R-E-E-N.com. Opt yourself out of unsolicited uh, credit offers for the next five years. You're going to select the electronic five-year opt-out, and then that will get you some points as well, typically. Uh, but those are really the fast ones. Or get signed on as an authorized user on a credit card that you're already paying on. Do not be scummy and go out and find a company that's willing to sell you a trade line that is considered fraudulent in the in the financial world. But if you have a bill that you're already paying on, like if my wife has a credit card and it's an excellent standing, my income is definitely going towards that. Our household income is going towards that. I can and should be on that credit card. So she can just call up, say, hey, add Sam, here's his date of birth, here's his social. All of a sudden I'm getting credit for that credit card that I'm paying on as an authorized user. So, okay. I mean, all, but credit cards is really where- Yeah, credit cards are really the same, the main thing to focus on if you want to get your credit up quickly is, you know, paying those down to those thresholds. And then there's a little trick with the opt-out pre-screen. I know some clients have seen a couple point increase just from that. So that can be a great thing as well. Okay. So moving along, like, you know, a lot of people come to me and they see their credit, uh, credit score on Credit Karma, or they get something in the mail from their Discover card or Capital One, and it shows them what this credit score is. So then they come and say, well, Rob, you know, I, I'm showing this is a, a 680 credit score. Credit Karma's got me at a 702 credit score, whatever the case may be. Then me as a lender, I pull their credit or another lender pulls their credit and they come in, maybe they come in with a credit score that's 30, 40, 50 points less. And I've also had some times where they'll come in just the other day where it was like 30 points more. So can you just put the rumors to rest for one second and explain why that credit karma or a credit card company is gonna give you a different, sometimes dramatically different credit score than what a mortgage lender is gonna pull? Yeah, I'll give you the technical answer and then I'll give you my conspiracy theory answer as well, okay? so. The, the, the easy answer is that you're looking at different scoring algorithms, okay? So it would be like, it would be like if we were watching the same football game, but what, on the one that you're watching, touchdowns are worth six, and on the one that I'm watching, they're worth 10. Or that a fumble costs you four points, and in your game, it costs you no points, right? Just change the possession. It's different rules to the game. It's different scoring to the same game. So 
even though a credit report is the same, information's the same, right, on the credit report for the most part, it just may be presented a little bit differently. But at the end of the game, when they tally the score, it's harder to score in the mortgage world. And that's the one that counts. So the credit scoring algorithm that's set up, the model that is set up for the mortgage world is different than the one that's available to consumers. So when we go online and we go to freegarbagescore.com, and we pull our score, yes, the information is okay. Yes, the credit score in general, you can kind of follow it to see how it goes, but at the end of the day, there is no, there is nothing more important than getting a home loan uh, for our family, right? And so it just doesn't matter. You can be upset all you want about the credit score that you pulled online, not matching what a mortgage lender pulls, but at the end of the day, the mortgage lender score is the end all be all. Now, what's kind of infuriating to all of us you know, as consumers is that we do not have access to the mortgage score. So it's not just that it's a different score, it's that we can't even get it besides from a mortgage lender, right? Which is kind of weird, but it's not your fault. It's not the mortgage world's mortgage lender's fault. Um, and so then why does this happen? Why are you presented with a scoring algorithm that doesn't make sense? Why would a consumer not have access to their mortgage score? And what I like to do is kind of follow the clues. And what's crazy is that you go to these you know, again, freegarbagescore.com or wherever, you know, you're going, you can, you can insert the big ones there, but you go there and then they say, okay, here are your credit scores. And they give you these inflated credit scores. And then over to the side, there are suggestions on credit cards that you should now apply for based on this garbage score. The problem is that the credit card companies that are being advertised over here based on your garbage score here, they don't pull that garbage score either. So they're going to be pulling a different credit score now, and they're going to say, oh, you did have this credit score, and if that were true, you would have qualified for this credit card. But when we pulled a score that's not this algorithm, you now qualify for this credit card with this horrible interest rate and this monthly or yearly fee. So I believe it's not only – so the technical answer is it's different scoring algorithms. So you're looking at two different computations of the same information, which is why – your online score is different than, than Rob's score, right? And then beyond that, why is that happening so much on those uh, sites? I believe that it's a bait and switch and getting clients to sign up for um, credit cards that uh, aren't a good, you know. Because they get paid. Don't they get paid when they, when they, somebody, you know, puts in an application, whether they get approved or not? I believe there's some sort of commission. So it's in their best interest to get you all motivated and hyped up with a high score so that you'll think, oh, wow, I'll go ahead and apply for that card then. You know, that can be a really great thing for them as far as making money. So I agree with you on the conspiracy theory part. And I mean, I've seen that a lot myself. Um, like I said, most of the time, your mortgage score is going to be a little bit less, but I've seen a few that are more as well. So, you know, don't prejudge. Um, but hopefully that gives you guys some good insight on why your score might be different between an online or your credit card statement versus a mortgage lender. So for somebody that's, you know, maybe they're just building their credit. Maybe they had some issues years ago. Their credit score is in the 400s or low 500s. And they're, you know, they know that they're six to 12 or 24 months out from buying a home. Other than obviously getting into a credit repair, getting with a professional on a personal level, if they want to start just building things themselves and getting their credit on the up and up, what are the main things that you think a, you know, someone with that lower, poor type of credit score could do right away to start improving? Yeah, um, I would suggest secured credit cards at that point. I mean, a lot of people are going to get a little upset um, and say, I don't want one of these secured credit cards. I, I get that you don't want it. I don't blame you, but it's, it's the situation that you're in and it's what you need to do. I mean, I, the thing with me is, Rob, is that we are just going to shoot clients super straight because no credit repair company does. And it's not that I'm not compassionate about their situation. It's that I understand what their goals are and their goals are home ownership, which means a place for your kids to lie your head. So this isn't the time to beat around the bush like most credit repair companies would. So the answer is get a credit card, one that you don't want, a $200 secured card build on it until your credit scores are up in the 600s, then we can look at a, a, a mid-range credit card that's, you know, probably going to still be high interest rate, low limit, but you're getting more towards where you want to be. And then all of a sudden your credit scores are 700 and oh my gosh, this whole new world of normal credit cards opens up to you, you know, but in the very beginning, 
you have to reestablish credit. You have to show people that you are not a risk. I mean, again, it's a risk-based model. So what you have to do is be able to look at your credit report. It's like your resume, right? It's like your financial resume. And if I look at your credit or if I look at your resume and I'm like, man, you no know showed on four of your jobs. Looks like you had a huge gap in job history, right? Like you need to be able to have that job where you're like, but right, look, I was there and you can even call, I have references. Same thing with your credit report. You have to create that account where you're like, but look at this one. I paid it on time every single time. There was never a late pay. Doesn't that afford me or, you know, earn me another chance with you? And sooner or later, the answer will be yes. And then you, and then you piggyback, you know, and, and or leapfrog up to having really good credit and really good opportunity. So on the secured credit cards, are there any particular vendors that do that that you recommend or should they just go to their local bank or credit union and ask? I like the credit builder card. Um, we had it, you know, we had a hand in having it specifically designed for the credit, you know, the, the credit world the, the, of folks who needed this. And so it's a $200 secured card. Um, it reports to all three credit bureaus. It reports very quickly, usually in the three week range where a lot of credit cards are going to take two to three months to show up on credit. Um, and so this thing is just, it's just designed for exactly what we need it to be designed for. There are other, uh, cards out there that we can recommend. Um, but credit builder is our first and foremost. You can also credit builder is actually one I've been using for a while as well. That's very good. And for all the listeners and viewers, we are going to go ahead and put a link to the credit builder card wherever you're watching or listening to this so you can go ahead and take a look at that if it meets your particular needs so if somebody's got a thin credit file maybe they've got no credit score or they've got you know nothing recent is it the same recommendations of getting a secured credit card or is there anything else they should be doing if they've got like no credit or a very thin credit file yeah, I mean, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. In a perfect world, you want to have a proper mix of credit. So you want to have installment loans, which are going to be like, and you don't, that's, a, that's the messed up thing, Rob, is you don't want to have them, right? Like in the grand scheme of things, like it's, it's messed up that you would have to have an auto loan, a student loan, a personal loan, a mortgage loan to generate a credit score. But again, it's the rules of a game and we don't get to make the rules if we want to borrow money, right? The people that, that lend the money get to make the rules. So to answer your question, if you want to build a strong credit file, it's going to have a proper mix of credit, which is a revolving account, which is code word for credit card usually. Um, and, and you honestly probably want to have two credit cards um, at least. Uh, you want to have an installment loan, which is your auto loan, a student loan, a mortgage loan. And sometimes those things just kind of happen for you. You're going to, almost everybody's going to have student loans, whether we meant to or not. Right. So a lot of times those gaps have been filled in, but I'm just saying this because if you have three great credit cards and you're wondering why don't my scores ever get above, you know, a 676, I just don't get it no matter what I do. It's because you're missing that component of having the proper mix of credit. But I will say in the very beginning when you're building credit to have two revolving accounts or three revolving accounts, meaning two or three credit cards, that is still going to plug that immediate, you know, gap of no positive trade lines where on the flip side of it, if you only had installment loans, I mean, sorry. So if you had two or three credit cards, you're going to generate a credit score and start building credit. Right. But if you only had two or three, um, installment loans, you won't see the same impact because it is a risk-based model. They want to see you being risky and installment loans are not that risky because you've already been pre-qualified for them based on the money that they know you make. And so they've already set a, a, a fixed amount, you know, a set term and payment. So that's a much safer loan because it's been, you know, kind of verified that you can afford it or a credit card. They're kind of like, well, here you go. Let's see what you do with it. Right. And so you can build immediately just off of only credit cards. You can't really build off of only installment loans and eventually you're gonna to wanna to have that mix of both. Okay, so starting out with maybe a secured card or an authorized user card and then building up to an installment loan as well, then they'll start that mix of credit like you're saying and building out a credit file. Yeah, and when you're starting from zero, from no credit, you're usually gonna to wanna to have at least two credit cards. Just getting one credit builder card, a lot of times will not generate that score. You need to have two 
revolving trade line. So whether the cool thing with the credit builder card is you can get two of them. You can stack them. You can apply for two on the same day and then have them report. You just got to remember that it's two payments. Otherwise, get the credit builder and then go get, you know, open sky or get the credit builder and then go to your local bank and get a, a, a credit building card. The thing is though, um, since I mentioned that when you go into your local bank, just realize guys, they do not know what they're talking about when it comes to credit. Most times when they're telling you to open up these CDs and then it's going to help build credit and stuff like that. It, 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 the impact is so minimal that you need to focus your money and your efforts on revolving trade lines. So if you go into your local bank, you're going to ask these questions. Do you have a credit building credit card? Does it report to all three bureaus? Say it again, does it report to all three bureaus? Because that is very important. And, um, and how quickly does it report? If they then start trying to sell you on putting 500 or $1,000 into a CD and that a year from now, blah, 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 do not do it. it, it it's not worth it. Okay. And they all do it just to get you to open up more accounts with them.